Ranger's Apprentice, Book 2, The Burning Bridge, by John Flanagan. Prologue. Hold and Will had been trailing their wargles for three days. The four heavy-bodied brutish creatures, foot soldiers of the rebel warlock Morgoth, had been sighted passing through Redmond Thief heading north. Once word reached the ranger, he had set out to intercept them, accompanied by his young apprentice. Where, where could they have come from, Hold? Will asked, doing one of their short rest stops. Surely we got three steps past well and truly bottled up by now. Three Step Pass provided the only real access between the Kingdom of Erolan and the Mountain of Rain and Night, where Morgoth had his headquarters. Now that the Kingdom was preparing for the coming war with Morgoth, a company of infantry and archers had been sent out to reinforce the small permanent garrison at the narrow pass until the main army could assemble. That's the only place where they can come in sizable numbers, all agreed. But small party like this could slip into the Kingdom by way of the barrier cliffs. Morgoth's domain was an inhospitable mountain plateau that towered high above the southern reaches of the kingdom. From Free Step Pass in the east, a line of sheer, precipitous cliffs ran roughly due west, forming the border between the plateau and Erolan. As the cliffs swung southwest, they plunged into another obstacle called the fissure, a huge split in the earth that ran out to the sea and separated Morgoth's lands from the kingdom of the Celts. It was these natural fortifications that had kept Arolan and neighboring Celtica safe from Morgoth for the past 16 years. Conversely, they also provided the rebel warlord with protection from Arolan's forces. I thought those cliffs were impassable, Will said. Hald allowed himself a grim smile. No way is ever really impassable, particularly if you ever have no respect for how many lives you lose trying to prove the fact. My guess is that they used ropes and grapples and waited for a moonless night and bad weather. That way they could slip past the border patrols. He stood, signifying that the rest stop was an end. Will rose with him and they moved towards their horses. Hall gave a small grunt as he swung into the saddle. The wound he had suffered in the battle with the two Kalkara still troubled him a little. My main concern isn't where they came from, he continued. It's where they're heading and what they have in mind. The words were barely spoken when they heard a shout from somewhere ahead of them, followed by a commotion of grunting and finally the clash of weapons. And we may be able to find out, Holt finished. He urged Lapalite into a gallop, controlling the horse with his knees as his hands effortlessly selected an arrow and knocked it to the string of his massive longbow. Will scrambled onto Took's saddle and galloped after him. He couldn't match Holt's hands for riding skill. He needed his right hand for the reins as he held his own bow ready on his left. They were riding through sparse woodland, leaving it to the sur-footed ranger horses to pick up the best route. Suddenly, they burst clear of the trees into a wide meadow. Abelard, under his rider's urging, slid to a stop, took following suit behind him. Dropping the reins to Tukin's necks, Will instinctively reached for an arrow from his quiver and knocked it ready. A large fig tree grew in the middle of the cleared ground. At the base of it, there was a small camp. A wisp of smoke still curled from the fireplace and a pack of blanket roll lay beside it. The four war girls they had been tracking surrounded a single man who had his back to the tree. For the moment, his long sword held them at bay. But the war girls were making small fainting movements towards him, trying to find an advantage. They were armed with short swords and an axes, and one carried a heavy iron spear. Will drew in sharp breath at the sight of the creatures. After following their trail for so long, it was a shock to come upon them, so suddenly, in plain sight, bear-like in build, they had long muscles and massive yellow canine fangs, exposed now as they snarled at their prey. They were covered in shaggy fur and wore black leather armor. The man was dressed similarly, and his voice cracked in fear as he repelled their tentative attacks. S stand back! I'm on a mission from Lord Morgoth. Stand back! I order you! I, I order you in Lord Mo Morgoth's name! Hold nudged Abelard around, allowing him room to draw the arrow he had already on the string. Drop your weapons, all of you, he shouted. Five pairs of eyes swung towards him as the four wargles and their prey turned in surprise. The wargle with the spear recovered first, realizing that the swordsman was distracted. He darted forward and ran the spear into his body. A second later, Holt's arrow buried itself in the wargle's heart, and he fell dead beside his stricken prey. As the swordsman sank to his knees, 
the other Wargals charged at the two rangers. Shambling and bear-like as they might be, they covered ground with incredible speed. Holt's second shot dropped the left-hand Wargal. Will fired the one in the right and realizes instantly that he had missed just the brute speed. The arrow hissed through the space where the Wargal had been in second before. His hand flew to his quiver for another arrow and he heard a hoarse grunt of pain as Holt's third shot buried itself in chest of the middle creature. Then Will loosened his second arrow at the surviving Wargal, now terrifyingly close. Panicked by those savage eyes and yellow fangs, he snatched as he released the arrow and knew it would fly wide. As the Wargal snarled in triumph, Took came to his master's aid. The little horse reared and lashed out with his front hooves at the horrific creature in front of him. Unexpectedly, he also danced forward a few steps toward the threat rather than retreating. Will, caught by surprise, clung to the pommel of the saddle. The Wargal was equally surprised. Like all its kind, it had deep-seated instinctive fear of horses. A fear born at the Battle of Harkham Heath 16 years ago, where Morgul's first Wargal army had been decimated by Aroland cavalry. It hesitated now for a fatal second, stepping back before those flashing hooves. Holt's fourth arrow took it in the throat. At certain such short range, the arrow tore clean through. With a final grunting shriek, the Wargal fell dead on the grass. White faced, Will slid to the ground, his knees nearly giving way beneath him. He clung to Toot's side to stay upright. Hall swung down quickly and moved to the boy's side. His arm went around him. It's all right, Will. His deep voice cut through the fear that filled Will's mind. It's over now. But Will shook his head, horrified by the rapid train of events. Hall, I missed twice. I, I panicked and I missed. He felt a deep sense of shame that he had let his teacher down so badly. Hall's arm tightened around him and he looked up at the bearded face and the dark, deep-set eyes. There's a big difference between shooting at a target and shooting at a charging wargal. A target is usually trying to kill you. Paul added, the last few words in a more gentle tone. He could see that Will was in shock, and no wonder, he thought grimly. But, but, I, I missed. And next time, you won't. Now you know it's better to fire one good shot than two hurried ones, Paul said firmly. Then he took Will's arm and turned him towards the campsite under the fig tree. Let's see what we have here, he said, putting an end to the subject. The black-clad man and the walker lay dead beside one another. Holden knelt beside the man and turned him over, whistling softly in surprise. Dirk Reacher, he said half to himself. He's the last person I would have expected to see here. You know him? Will ask his in satiable curiosity was already helping him to put the horror of the previous few minutes to one side, as Hall had known it would. I chased him out of the kingdom five or six years ago, the ranger told him. He was a coward and a murderer. He deserted from the army and found a place with Morgraft. Morgraft seemed to specialize in recruiting people like him. But what was he doing here? He, he said he was in a mission for Morgraft, Will suggested, but Hall shook his head. Unlikely. The Wargals were chasing him, and only Morgoroth could have ordered them to do that, which he'd hardly do if Reaches really were working for him. My guess is that he was deserting again. He'd run out on Morgoroth and the Wargals were sent after him. But why? Why desert? Hall shrugged. There's a war coming. People like Dirk try to avoid the sort of unpleasantness. He reached for the pack that lay by the campfire and began to rummage through it. Are you looking for anything in particular? Will asked. Hall frowned as he grew tired of looking through the pack and dumped its content onto the ground. Well, it strikes me that if he were deserting Morgoroth and coming back to Aroland, he'd have to bring something to bargain for his freedom, so... His voice died away as he reached for a carefully folded parchment among the spare clothes and eating utensils. He scanned it quickly. One eyebrow rose slightly. After almost a year with the Grizzled Ranger, Will knew that that was the equivalent of a shout of astonishment. He also knew that if he interrupted Hall before he had finished reading, his mentor would simply ignore him. He waited until Hall folded the parchment, stood slowly and looked at his apprentice, seeing the question in the boy's eyes. Is it important? Will asked. Oh, you could say so, Hall told him. We appear to have stumbled on Morgoth's battle plans for the coming war. I think we'd better get them to the Redmond. He whistled softly, and Abelard and Took trotted to where their masters waited. 
from the trees, several hundred meters away, carefully downwind so that the ranger horses would catch no scent of an intruder, and friendly eyes were upon them. Their owner watched as the two rangers rode away from the scene of the small battle. Then he turned south towards the cliffs. It was time to report to Morgoth. His plan had been a success.